try to hack humans unless I'm trying to hack the platform because you're always going to be a step behind. Facebook is trying to hack humans. Twitter is trying to hack humans. The, all of these platforms have teams of thousands of engineers just trying to understand how they can make their products sticky and valuable and get people to keep coming back and using them, right? So if you are trying to hack the platform, you're behind. Well, hey, everyone, this is Scott, and thanks for downloading the latest episode of The Scott King Show, where I talk with sales and marketing leaders from all over the world on how they are building their brands and growing their businesses. In this episode, I'm talking with Juan Felipe Campos, or otherwise known as Juanican. Juan is a Silicon Valley-based growth hacker and VP of tech and partner at the Manos Accelerator via the Google Launchpad. So Juan consults all types of startups on growth and customer acquisition. Throughout his career, Juan and his team have grown several online communities exceeding 100,000 members. He currently runs the largest growth hacking group in Silicon Valley and joins me today to talk about how we can build our communities and grow into uh, a big, big following. So Juan, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you, Scott. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure. You know, I'm I'm always interested in building communities and building tribes. And, and uh, you know, most people with social media are interested in followers and things like that. Um, so it's, you know, it's a big deal and there's a lot of content out there available. But you know, you built enormous communities, uh, you know, through all the the tech startups. And, you know, I'm really curious, you know, how you did it and, and why you're the guy. You know, do you have a secret bag of tricks or is it just uh, is it just trial and error or you kind of wired that way? Why? Why is this kind of your thing? Yeah, definitely. So I do have a secret bag of tricks and I'm happy to share all of my tricks with you and with the audience. But ultimately, what I discovered in doing growth hacking is that no matter how much I obsessed over growing on Facebook or on Instagram or how to do tw Twitter auto mentions so that you could drive people to the website and then you could retarget them, and no matter how much I obsessed with these tactics, they always went out of date. Three months later, six months later, a year later, the algorithm changed. Then you were always kind of on the, on the defense to try to figure out what the new strategy was. And I didn't like that because I wanted to be someone that, you know, 30 years from now could say something like, I've been doing this for 30 years and I'm like excellent at this one discipline. And that really frustrated me with these like tactical, super growth hacky ways of doing things. And it wasn't until I met Josh Vector, who is actually the founder of Badass Marketers and Founders, the Facebook group that uh, you refer to, which is the largest one in Silicon Valley for growth hacking and for um, marketers and founders, over 20,000 members. It wasn't until I met him that I realized that the skills required to build a community and to be a great leader have nothing to do with the platforms themselves and everything to do with humans. And now I always joke of like, Alexander the Great didn't have Slack and the Great Pyramids weren't built with like a Trello board. Like there are some things that are just true of people and being a good leader. And then if you use the platforms as a way to be more scalable in being that leader and building a community, then you're gonna be more successful than just thinking, in terms of hacking something that just lasts three months or six months. With that being said, I do have some tricks that last three months, six months, and I don't know if they're gonna be around a year from now, but I've just made it more like my life mission to obsess over the community building and the hacking, how people um, come together around our common costs rather than just how you blow up on Instagram or on YouTube. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, you mentioned Josh. I've talked to Josh as well. He's an interesting character and, and quite young, but he's he's done some interesting things really from like a content perspective. You know, he's he, you know, when I see him on uh, on LinkedIn, when I see him, it's it's mostly, you know, just a very clever, um, you know, LinkedIn post. And but what you don't realize is that he tested that long time ago on Quora or some other platforms. Um, you know, so, so, you know, one, that is interesting. And then, and then two, you talked about, you know, growth hacking and tactics, how they change all the time. Um, you know, that's very true. What, you know, what made you realize that, you know, chasing after the algorithm or, you know, just doing all the research and just making sure that you're trying to stay on top of what is current? Like, when did you realize that's not going to work? 
I guess if I brought it down to a moment, it was the day that Instagram shut down. <laughs> Instagram was a tool that helped uh, us grow a lot. We built the backbone of a travel tech startup that got funded by Sprint actually um, around Instagram. Instagram was our bread and butter. It, it was everything to us, Instagram. And the day that Instagram shut down, <laughs> it just made me so mad because it was so frustrating. I was building like all of this traction and momentum around one platform. And then one day it just shuts down because the, I don't know, Instagram you know, change its terms of service or whatever their API. And then all of a sudden this tool is gone. And I was just so frustrated by that. And I, I do like growth hacking. I absolutely love it because I see it as the one thing you can control to, um, to guarantee some level of success on any project you ever work on. And that that's exciting to me. The fact that I can work in a new tech project with confidence, knowing that it will get traction, that this podcast will get listened to. That's awesome. That's a good feeling to operate from. So I do like the tactics, but yeah, the, the day that I fell in love, that I fell out of love with, um, obsessing over the tools and became more in love with obsessing over people was the day Instagram shut down. And then, you know, I'm, I'm curious, you know, we, I'm not familiar with that tool. Uh, you know, I'm not big on, on Instagram anyway. Um, but I'm, I'm curious, like what type of challenges, you know, transfer from one platform to the other, right? Because I would assume that when you're advising companies or clients, you, you know, they, they need revenue, right? So they, they need, they need eyeballs and they need clicks and they need conversions. What are some of the things that you've noticed that easily transfer from one platform to the other? And maybe maybe some things that don't, right? So, you know, Instagram is very visual, whereas some other platforms are very text heavy. Are there any common, you know, tactics that you that you, you know, advise on or that you use for clients or, you know, kind of what I'm looking for is the lowest common denominator? Sure. I would say anything that drives engagement in terms of shares, that works. Like that is by definition viral. So if you're able to create content that people are engaging with, they're commenting, they're tagging their friends, they're sharing it, they're sending it to each other via DM, that is viral content. Like by pure definition, I think sometimes we go for the short-term metric, like the like or just a comment, but ideally we should be going for the share and for the retention. So I actually learned this um, from Yuval Rector, who is the head of digital at First Media. It's the largest media company in the world for millennial women, responsible for the most viral video of all time on Facebook, over 26 billion views on the platform. The two things that they care about is retention. So like th there can't be any drop off in the content, or ideally we're minimizing for it, and share rate. Not views. Views come as a result of that share rate and the retention. So as long as people are consuming your content all the way through, a very high percentage are getting all the way to the bottom of your blog post or are actually reading your entire status update or are watching the whole video. As long as we're optimizing for that, and that means everything you think it means. Like, does that mean I have to look at the analytics and figure out where people are dropping off? Yes. Does that mean that I need to constantly be tweaking my content to make sure that there is no drop off? Yes. Does it mean, what does it mean that it has to be shareable? Does it mean it has to be like value packed? Yes. Does it mean that I need to understand my audience well enough that they actually, that I know that this would be the thing that they would like forward their coworkers and their, yes, yes. It, it means everything you think it means. Like if you just have an amazing share rate, if you have good retention, then that works. And so a strategy that works multi-platform that I've seen do really well, we do uh, giveaway bundles of digital resources. So we'll put together spreadsheets of like, here's 350 accelerators you can apply your startup to, or here's over 80 different grants for your VR, AR startup, or, you know, here's like um, 100 different platforms that you can get funding for your company, right? So these are super valuable resources. If you came across the list once, you would probably send it with a, you, you'd probably share it with a friend. And what we've done is we just post them natively on every social media platform and we DM, we direct message to people, all we ask is that they like and comment. So if you want this resource, like and comment below and I'll send it to you. This has worked 100% of the time um, on every platform. I see it work on Twitter, it's worked on LinkedIn, it's worked on Facebook. Um, there's sometimes that it doesn't, like if you don't have the right uh, friend circle, you haven't worked long enough to network with the right people, that's when it wouldn't work as well. But if you're sitting on a very valuable list of connections in one industry, and you have a good niche audience with a good value prop and awesome resources, it always gets shared. And then that um, jump starts a content machine. So that that's kind of like the, the thing that works really well is engagement. Yeah, that is interesting. That that reminds me of a 
uh, of a post that I saw on LinkedIn from, uh, so I don't even know who this is, but their, their domain is like you dash exec. And they did this with a PowerPoint template on LinkedIn and everyone loves PowerPoint templates. And they said, Hey, if you want the template, just kind of like it or share it. And yeah, it was hundreds of thousands of shares, right? For basically these guys like did a clever PowerPoint template. There was no content in it. It was just kind of the design, right? And it kind of, it kind of just moved the needle over of what is possible. You know, it's not like six bullet points on a PowerPoint. There was actually like some native graphs and stuff. But, um, but that's interesting. The shareability is that kind of one thing that, that you look for? Because as you said, you know, there's kind of a chain of events that has to happen, uh, with, you know, retention and audience. And you basically have to know what you're doing to get the share rate. So that's kind of an interesting view. Yeah, and it's all very data-driven. If you just realize that what you're looking for is content that's very shareable, then and you let that be your north star, then you you can start digging the right places for that kind of content. Like, does that mean I can go on Reddit and find content that's gone viral before and then create my own version of it? Yeah, does that mean that I can go into a website of one of my competitors and find their most valuable resource that they've ever put out and make something that's 10x better? You know, you can go to YouTube and sort you know, write any keyword, like let's say uh, freelance or podcast or, you know, any keyword that you it's in your industry. And then you can sort your videos, not by relevance, but by most viewed to least viewed. So you're going to see the content that um, has already trended in front of that audience in the past. You can do this on Pinterest. You can do this on Imgur. So if you just have that virality be your North Star, there's plenty of places that you can find it. BuzzSumo is a tool that can help you find content that has done, re- that has performed really well in that audience or on that website. Um, so there's there's a lot of ways to do it. Uh, one way to not do it, though, is to just operate from gut instinct and to just create content thinking that you create it and then the show ends the moment someone just consumes it. Ideally, it would be content that you created with the intention that it will be shared and you're confident that it's going to get shared because it has proven itself in the past when other people have created content around this topic and then you launch it. And then you're you're sprinkling in or booby trapping it with virality, so there's a reason for someone to share it with someone else. That that works really well, and it works on every platform. Because again, this is more of a human thing than it is a platform thing. Yeah, it's very much um, you know you kind of describe the skyscraper uh, methodology. I forget who actually did that, right? Um, but uh, but yeah, find find something that is already very popular and just make it better. Um, so that's that's kind of interesting. Is that you know, in terms of building a, a community, is that the most valuable component or what do you think is the most valuable component when when you're trying to build your own community and your own following? Yeah, I would say that's probably the most valuable component. It's just having awesome, having an awesome kind of, you can call them perks, I guess, to be a part of that uh, exclusive club. You know, if you join a club and there's awesome perks. You get a gym membership and a you know pool and there's a spa and there, there's all of these perks. There's all of these points of interest about being a part of that community. It makes the sale much easier for people that are in that community to then be ambassadors of the brand and invite everybody they know. So you know th- this isn't even a marketing thing as much as a product thing. Your, your product is your community, which means it needs to be really awesome. There has to be awesome content in there that people really want to just share and they like it should feel as if the community is going to blow up at any moment because the content is just so good and everyone's you know they're commenting they're super excited they're posting images they like the times that I've done this that I've seen it work the best even when there was only 100 people in there everybody was so excited to be a part of the group and then very quickly it starts blowing up because they start inviting their friends and then their friends invite other friends and yeah, you ultimately want to see your product as the community, which means it needs to be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good products, right? A, a, a good product sells itself, right? Um, so you, I mean, you have a lot of experience on a lot of different technologies and services um, dealing with all the clients. And I'm, I'm kind of curious, you know, since you've been doing this, uh, you know, one, uh, you know, how, how, how long do you think that you've been doing this? And then how do you see all of our digital experiences evolving? Right. So like, you know, what, what have you seen in the past and maybe where do you think it's going? And, and I don't mean like people that run into me at the grocery store because they can't peel their eyes off of their phone. Uh, but, (laughs) but, uh, you know, since, since we're so engaged in our, in our personal devices and we carry these digital experiences with us ever, 
you know, everywhere, our expectations of how it should work evolve. So I'm kind of curious, like, how do you see all of these digital experiences and communities evolving? Well, so I've been doing this for eight years now. And what I've seen is the evolution of the platform changing our behavior. And so at the beginning, it used to be that you would only connect with people that you actually knew in real life. That's definitely changed uh, now, especially with tools that are centered around interests, common interests, as opposed to a shared in real life connection. Let me give you an example. On LinkedIn, on Facebook, you typically only add your 300 to 500 um, friends, acquaintances, you know, people you actually know in real life. Whereas on a platform like Instagram or on Twitter, we behave very differently. We actually will follow people that we don't know at all because we are we share the same interests or they put out content that is very interesting to us. It's in the same industry, right? So that a lot of that Twitter culture, a lot of that Instagram culture has um, changed the way that LinkedIn and that Facebook uh, operates, which, you know, there's a lot of people that may follow Josh, for example, going back to to that example, that may have never talked to him. They don't know him, but they'll just add him as a LinkedIn connection. This is kind of a new behavior that we have where we're starting to add people on Facebook, starting to add people on LinkedIn based on shared interests, which is where communities really can come in as opposed to um, us knowing them in, in person. And that's awesome because it's going to create a dynamic. It has created a dynamic and it will continue to create a dynamic where um, communities will be more important than ever. Because now you don't have to be, it's the beautiful thing about the in, internet, now you don't have to be friends with Joe just because it's convenient, just because he physically lives close to you. Now you can be friends with Paul who lives you know, 800 miles away but loves 90% of the things you love or you both shared a deep passion for drones or whatever the case may be, right? So I think that's going to continue to go strong. And then the other second prediction is that um, ads are getting much more expensive now that bigger and bigger companies are pouring their budgets into paid advertisement. And what that means is there, there continues to be this white space for people that are very creative about, um, attention. I think some of the things that we're doing with the community are super creative. Like I, I haven't seen it done yet by like a really big company, like a Walmart or a Nissan or anything like that of posting resources, adding people to a community. But so, it, and I see that as the white space. Like if you're able to, Use the face, use Facebook, use LinkedIn in creative ways that maybe isn't intended to get that traction, to get those eyeballs. Then um, you're you're definitely going to be able to leapfrog the slower moving companies that are already flooding the um, the paid ad route. So my prediction is that the ads are either going to get way, way, way more valuable if as these big brands start implementing more of these creative things, or um, or the people that are actually going to crush it, the small businesses that go, let's say from zero to like $10 million a year or something like that. These super fast growing businesses are going to have awesome content because they can't just rely on spending money on Facebook ads. They're going to have to get really creative and that's good for us as consumers. There's going to be tons of free stuff coming, tons of free resources and perks to just be around these brands because they so desperately need our attention. So those are kind of my two big predictions, communities, and also just the value of ads is going to get really, really interesting for us as consumers. All right. So, so you really think that the, the creative mind is going to become more valuable, right? So I really like that, you know, grabbing the attention because, you know, an interesting story doesn't necessarily mean that you have to spend a whole lot of budget on, you know, an ad or a video, right? And I'm, and I'm thinking I use, I overuse the Dollar Shave Club guy, uh, that first video, right? Because, um, one, it was just genius and it worked, right? They didn't know it was going to work, but it, it just, it hit a certain audience and it was very shareable and it was entertaining, right? So, so, uh, those guys grew until they were acquired, uh, essentially by, by Gillette. But yeah, the, the ad spend is only going to be more expensive, especially when, you know, when the big brands start to copy the, you know, the innovation and the creativity of the smaller players, then it's just going to drive the price up. And, you know, hopefully you can stay ahead of that game, right? If you're, if you're a marketer looking at, you know, attaining a big audience, then, um, you know, you, you do have to think a little bit differently. You can't just out buy the big guys. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and so that's that's good for us as consumers again because all that creativity is going to be deployed on like 
how can I make sure that I stay top of mind when like Walmart or, you know, Lexus has so much more money than me to throw at these people to get their attention. It means that I have to be that much more entertaining, that much more valuable and cool. Cause that means like their ads and their value and their content is just going to have to really, really step, be stepped up. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. And then Juan, I'm, I'm curious what, um, I mean, you've got a lot of energy and a lot of knowledge. What do you listen to or read to, uh, to stay inspired? Is there a certain, certain podcast, certain YouTuber, uh, blog? What do you, what do you like to stay on top of? So I really like podcasts. My favorites right now are the AZ16 AZ podcast, which is the Anderson Horowitz podcast. I also really like all the content that Josh puts out um, in BAMF. I invite everybody to join Badass Marketers and Founders on Facebook and Houston. Um, we're the three moderators of the group. So they are a big inspiration to me. Also, the CEO of Manus Accelerator via Google Launchpad, Sylvia Flores, is a great, uh, has been a great mentor in my life. The content that you've all rector put, uh, posts on LinkedIn is also fantastic. I've developed a great relationship with him. Um, Chad Gutstein is someone else that posts awesome content on LinkedIn. Matt, Matt Gielen, Matthew Gielen, uh, demystifies the YouTube algorithm. I think he posts awesome content on LinkedIn. But yeah, I'll, I'll, I would say if I were to bring it down to one thing that I consume, podcasts, I really, really like. That Neil Patel has a great podcast. Um, yeah, I'm basically always listening to new content. Yeah, I like uh, Neil's podcast. Oh, it's, it's really oh my gosh, I forgot. Oh, sorry, um, I forgot a, a major one that has been a big influence for me is uh, The Top by Nathan Latka. It's also an amazing podcast, especially for uh, SaaS founders. And then Scott Oldford also has a great podcast. And there's tons of good podcasts out there. You just have to look for them. But I, I love them because it makes all those hidden moments of cleaning you know, cleaning the house or like, you know, mowing the lot, like what all of these hidden moments, uh, you can turn them into learning time. And so I'm really big on podcasts. Yeah, I love it. Uh, me too. I actually produce my own. So, uh, but I, but I listen to, uh, to a lot of others and I do like the, uh, Andreessen Horowitz podcast. Uh, I really enjoy Freakonomics, uh, radio. That's a really good one. If you don't, uh, that's more nice. high level, but, uh, but I like that one a whole lot. And James Altucher. Uh, I always like yeah. listening, uh, listening to all his guests. Those are great. So how I built this by Guy Raz is also amazing. The NPR podcast. Yeah. Yeah. How I built this is good as well. Yeah. Uh, but definitely I, I do the same thing. Any dead time I'm listening to a, uh, to a podcast and it's mostly, you know, walking or walking the dog or, 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 uh, or cleaning or, or travel time. Uh, exactly. yeah. So if you didn't have any responsibilities, Juan at home or work next week, what would you do with your time? I would probably go see my family, first of all. Um, but if I just had a bunch of time to throw at something, I'd probably write an album. I actually, I started my career as a musician. I went to school for music business. In my whole life, I thought I was going to be a musician. And actually, it was it was because of that experience, and we were talking to record labels, and I was like super deep in the game, that I realized that if I didn't understand traction, like how to actually get sales then it didn't matter how good the music was. And it's actually music that brought me into entrepreneurship because I realized, holy crap, I need to get literate about attention and about just getting people excited about something. That matters almost as much, if not more, than the product itself. Um, there's so many starving artists that have amazing songs and no one's ever heard of them. So, But I would probably go back and do that. I I love music. I play the piano, guitar, drums, bass. I, I love, love, love music. I made myself a promise, my 16 year old self, that by the time I turn 30, I want to write and record an album where I play every instrument. And so I would probably take you up on this week to do that. <laughs> all right. It's very Trent Reznor of you. Yeah. Do, uh, do all the, uh, all the instruments. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, so if, if anybody had a question for you, Juan, what is your favorite way to be contacted? You mentioned every single social platform in there. What is, what's your favorite? My personal favorite is Facebook, uh, but really any of them are good. Like I also lo I love Twitter. I love LinkedIn. I'm using Instagram less and less, but people like feel free to contact me there as well. I'm pretty accessible. Um, f Facebook and LinkedIn is probably the most direct way to get my attention. I check them the most often. Okay. And then we can just search for Wanakin. 
Juan again, or yeah, Juan Felipe Campos. And I would love to answer any questions or talk to someone or ask you questions. You know, if you want to get in touch, that's the best place to do it. Okay. We'll definitely link back to you and uh, especially Josh's, uh, you know, badass marketing group. Uh, we'll definitely do definitely. that. Definitely. And then uh, any closing thoughts, Juan, as we, uh, as we shut down, it's, it's been great. I love the energy. So I'm kind of curious what, uh, what you may want to leave us with. Scott, thanks so much. Yep. You know, I would love for people to walk away from this conversation being inspired to actually try to hack humans and less on trying to hack the platform because you're always going to be a step behind. Facebook is trying to hack humans. Twitter is trying to hack humans. All of these platforms have teams of thousands of engineers just trying to understand how they can make their products sticky and valuable and get people to keep coming back and using them, right? So if you are trying to hack the platform, you're behind. You should be also trying to hack figure out how to hack humans. And then compliancy is another really big one. Just be the best at using those tools. They all have um, tons of different features for people to dominate in terms of content distribution. Um, I think that we like tend to resent these tools a lot. And like, how do we find the white space, the white space? It's like, you could just be the best. You don't have to be the hackiest Facebook page. You could just be the best that just produces the best content that people genuinely want to follow. So if you walk away with these truths and you're like, I, I see value in hacking people and just being a community uh, leader. That's, I, I would definitely wish that to be the takeaway more even than the tech, than the tactical stuff. Well, that is uh, that's outstanding. I love it. And, and yeah, those guys are way ahead of the rest of us in terms of hacking uh, human brains. Sure. <laughs> All right, Juan. Well, thanks so much for talking with me. I really appreciate it. And I uh, loved your energy. Thanks for spending time with my audience. Thank you so much, Scott. Hi, and thanks for listening. This is Scott King, where it is my goal to inform you how smart marketers build their brands and grow their businesses. Please subscribe to the podcast series at thescottking.com or follow me on Twitter at thescottking to grab the next link. If you like what you heard today, please go to iTunes and write a review. Always appreciate that. Thanks, and be sure and visit again.